Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a story. Every year people want more and more powerful machines. Ten years ago building a more powerful proce processor was a, something quite easy. You just went, out, uh, went up with the frequency of the core and that's, that's it. But today it's no longer possible. Uh, we do have limits at the, tech, at the level of technology. We cannot do that anymore. So what people started to do is people started to put at the beginning two, then four, then eight cores in one processor. And it doesn't seem that we are going to find another solution, so it seems that we are going to go up and up with the number of cores. So today I'm going to tell you about the port of Linux to an architecture with really, really many cores. Before I start, uh, my name is Marta Rybczyńska. I, work, uh, I have been working in embedded area for something like 10 years. Uh, I come from networking and security background, but currently I'm mostly doing kernel level work. The work I will be presenting uh, was in a part done by me, in a part by my friends, my friends at the operating system level, at the driver level, and the compiler, in the debugger, and also my hardware friends doing the processor itself. So, at the beginning, uh, I'm going to introduce you the architecture. Then I will move to the Linux port itself, first at the level of the core, so just the support of the core itself, and then the peripherals. Uh, debugging is pretty important, especially when you are running multi-core. So I will be, uh, I will show you our debugging methods too. And of course, uh, all the, uh, all the all future plans uh, for the port. So let's move to the architecture. The chip is called MPPA256 because it has 256 cores that are available to the user. It has some more and all of those cores are using the same instruction set. So it's completely uh, homogeneous and in fact the processor has many interesting features. So the, it has low, low power consumption, it's, it has nice performance, and it's very predictable. And also it has a lot of uh, external interfaces. And what is even nicer, it exists. Uh, this board is a pretty big one because we wanted to put nearly all of the uh, interfaces. So we had the PCI, we have the internet, you have all the other stuff uh, out there. Now, here you have the floor, floor plan of the, of the processor. When you can see that there is a, that, that big block uh, in the middle, that's the matrix, we call it the matrix. Uh, the processor has 16 uh, so called cluster groups of processors uh, in the middle. And it has four uh, smaller clusters at the periphery of the chip. Everything is connected by a network on chip. When we are going even, uh, even deeper, uh, one compute cluster, so one of those in the middle, it has 16 uh, pr processors uh, for the user and one for the system core, one system core. Uh, the 16 processors, they share memory. Uh, you have also, uh, the, of course, the interface for the network on chip. You have some debug capabilities. On the IO cluster, you have a quad core of four cores that also have some on chip memory. And they also have the access to all the other peripherals uh, of the chip. Now, this is schematic of the processor pipeline. If you do not, do not understand everything, it doesn't, uh, it's not really that important. Uh, what you can see uh, that uh, 
first, first important thing, that it's all the same for all the cores on the chip. It is a core that was done by us. It's our custom design. Uh, it's a five issue, uh, very long instruction word. Very long instruction word, it means that it, ca it can execute, in this case, five instructions in one cycle. Uh, it has a floating point unit. Oh, maybe I will go to the, uh, by the blocks. It, it can, uh, it can uh, branch, uh, of course branching. It has two uh, uh, arithmetic Unix units. It has a multiplication unit and a, a load store unit. It, uh, in fact, it can, uh, some of the operations can be done by multiple blocks. It has uh, many uh, instructions you would expect from a DSP, so the Mac or the Mac uh, types, for example. It has the floating point, uh, the new hardware. Uh, it has some specific instructions to operate at the bit level, some shifts, uh, permutations, things like that. It, was ha it has hardware loops, so the loops that do not have any penalty when you are running them. Uh, every core has an MMU, and you also have the control on the, uh, on the power levels uh, of, of the core. Of course, hardware is nice, but we want to have some so software uh, to run on the hardware. So what we are currently uh, ha uh, de uh, delivering to people is a standard toolchain you, you are pretty, pretty well uh, used to. So we have the GCC port, uh, we have the BNUTs, uh, NewLeap, uh, we have a GDB port also, we have our own simulator that's pretty accurate. You can see, uh, we'll see, uh, we see that later. We have a hardware system trace mechanism. Uh, the operating systems, what, you, uh, what people are using currently, uh, is a custom runtime running on the QMPute cluster. Think of the uh, OSV that was presented yesterday. So it's pretty, it, it's similar in, in many uh, areas. And we, uh, we are running currently a RTMS port on the cluster. RTMS is a real-time open source uh, operating system. Uh, we also have uh, drivers, especially the PCA driver. Uh, we have uh, many uh, different programming levels, but I'm not really going to talk about them, just about one of them, because this will be easiest to understand for the Linux people. In the POSIX programming level, uh, each cluster is represented and is visible like a, like a process. So your program starts in the air cluster. It can run 16 processes, up to 16 processes. That start on the cluster. And in the cluster, you can, uh, you can you do threading between uh, each thread we run on a separate core. Uh, we do offer the communication mechanism between the core in the form of, uh, of an IPC mechanism. Uh, at the threading level, you can either do P-thread yourself or you, or you, can, uh, uh, you can be helped with, by the compiler if you use OpenMP. I think I do not have to tell you at this conference why it's nice to have Linux running on a chip. In this in this particular case, uh, Linux has a very nice and perfor performant SMP. Uh, it has all of the device drivers for all the peripherals we may connect to the, to the chip. It has a very nice L and uh, well-performing network stack. Uh, oh, and of course, we have all the legacy applications on the user libraries they, they have already. Now let's move to the, to the Linux port. Here I've put the kernel version we have, versions we have used. As you can see, it's a pretty recent, uh, pretty recent, recent port. It started in uh, 2.6.32, uh, 33. Then we have moved quite rapidly to uh, 35 and then uh, 3.2. At the point, at the 3.2, uh, we have added the SMP support uh, and the first specific drivers. And in fact, the moment when the SMP, uh, when the 3.2 uh, 
uh, when we had the 3.2 was the moment when the chip came uh, from the fab and we, was, we and it ran for the first time on the real chip, on the real, on the real processor. That's pretty good. And then we have moved to 3.10. That's the version we are currently using. Uh, at 3.10, we've added the tracing support and the MME. So our camera, it can run on a single core or you can run in the SMP mode. Uh, we are running device trees from the beginning. Uh, and we are running generic headers when possible. That was pretty easy for us because the port was started when all this infrastructure was already present. So we, we've used that. Uh, we have the user space with the uh, FDP uh, FD model and we have some traces. Of course, we do have drivers. Uh, we have the general ones, the, the generic uh, simple things and some specific, uh, the PCI for example. At the user space, we are currently build, building with build root, uh, with our own tool chain, uh, and uh, micro CDPC. So, the core is pretty easy to port Linux to, in fact. That's why I'm not really going to tell you about the details of the port, because it was pretty straightforward. There are no modifications needed in the generic Linux to, uh, to make it running. Uh, we just had to fill the Arch K1 directory in this case. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you are some issues we've run into, as some things we've worked, uh, we worked on uh, that I, I, I find is interesting. So, at some point, at the SMP port, it started the locking. And the spin lock ticket was showing there is some corruption going on. The value was not coherent. So what you are doing when something like that happens? The first thing is that, of course, there is a bug somewhere. So the first idea, OK, we have a lock ordering problem in our platform code. First idea. OK, so we have, we have, we have looked at the lock that are in the in the in the in, the, uh, in our port, but nothing. And then we, for the first time, we've enabled the spin lock debugging. Uh, we didn't have that enabled uh, before that, so that was, 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 a, was a very good moment to, to add all the things necessary. We enabled the spin lock debug, some work necessary, and Nothing. Everything was right. So the situation looked uh, not that good. So we've run our simulator. Fortunately, the thing was also corrupting on the, on the simulator. So we ran the, the simulation trace that was uh, several gigabytes of, uh, of size and started analyzing what's going on uh, here. And the bug, in fact, was very simple. Uh, the exchange function should be returning the new uh, the, uh, the old value and it was returning the new one. It worked for a very long time. Oops. <laughs> uh, one line fix and it works now. The optimization uh, Another example, the atomic operations. Atomic operations are used in many places to do some uh, things you need to synchronize. If you are on a single core, it's pretty easy. You are enabling and disabling the interrupts. And it's pretty cheap on our core. So there were absolutely no problems with that. Then we moved to the SMP. On SMP, you have to use uh, processor support. In our case, it's component swap operation. And when you are using it, you see that there is impact on the code size and the speed of the kernel. The impact on the code size is pretty visible because the spin locks and all the things that are using the, some atomic operations, <laughs> they are all around the place. 
So it turned out that optimizing the atomic code uh, is a very important thing. So we've done multiple iteration over this code. The current implementation we have uh, was designed with the hardware people, in fact, together with them, to use the specific features of the caches and on the, of, the, of the write buffer. Uh, as, and as we have learned many things, uh, we have also improved the design of the atomic operations we have for the next version of the chip. As an idea, that's how an atomic operation looks in our, uh, our architecture. As you can see, there is no inline assembly out there. Uh, there's a macro to, there are two macros to do the visibility operations. Uh, in this case, there is a store, atomic store. And why we do not use uh, inline assembly? We do not use inline assembly if we can avoid it, uh, because our processor is a very long instruction word. You have a, an example of assembly code uh, for, uh, for our core here. You can see clearly that there are some groups of the instructions. Each of those group executes in, in, a, single, uh, in a single cycle. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty important uh, to put the groups right uh, in the code. Our GCC compiler uh, handles that pretty well. Uh, if you can do it manually if you want, for a short code, it's, yeah, it's something that you can do easily. But if the code is getting more complicated, or if you are going to change your code, as you, you need to handle the dependencies between the things you can do in one, uh, in one cycle, it becomes more complicated. So as the result, we do prefer the built-ins in our report uh, because the assembly inlines, they are put as a single bundle. So we, we are potentially losing three, inst three instructions we can do in the same cycle. So as a trivia, uh, our port has probably least assembly of uh, all the other ports uh, in the Linux tree. So now let's move to the peripherals. Uh, the first peripheral I would like you to, talk, to tell you about uh, is the interrupt controller. In the case of the IO cluster, uh, you have two levels. Uh, you have one, one interrupt controller uh, in the core itself, and you have the other interrupt controller that is shared between the four cores. And now how it works. Uh, you have four interrupt lines that come from the shared controller to each of the cores, and you have interrupt lines from the, some of the peripherals that are going directly into the core. For uh, such interrupt line, that's, for example, a timer. Uh, what we are trying to do in our report is to deal as much as we can uh, at the core level, so uh, to, to, uh, to deal uh, with the interrupt controller that is pretty close to the core and the operations are fast. But as we have many peripherals, we leave to the user uh, to decide how they are going to connect uh, the interrupts of the peripherals uh, they have. And in the future, on the boards they will build, they may to want to connect them uh, in many different ways. Then the memory, uh, how, how do we access memory? We ha the, processor in the processors in the IO clusters, do, they have access to two memory zones. Uh, there is a big DDR, the external memory, and there is a small uh, memory that is inside the chip. There is a big latency difference uh, between the two, so you can optimize your code, uh, your, co your code very well if you put some of the data or some of the code in the uh, fast memory. But to make the thing a little more complicated than that, the shared memory is also visible to the host by the PCI Express interface. So you also have to handle the PCI side of things. Uh, so 
how we, how we have handled all that is that by default, we do all allocations in the shared DDR and we have another allocator running uh, for the shared memory. And now the PCI. PCI in our case is our main interface at the moment and the driver, we, uh, we do provide the driver for Linux on the host side and that driver is, uh, is a subject for a it, that could be a subject of a presentation on its own because it's, uh, it's a big driver. Why it's big? Because it's doing really many things. It's doing the boot, uh, it's doing the DMA transfer, it's doing the protocol between the software running on the host, uh, the software running on the MPPA, and also each uh, MPPA has two PCI interfaces in fact. So the driver is also handling that, that there are two there may, there may be two interfaces that come from the, the same physical chip. At the host side, we do not have any problems with the Linux frameworks. The Linux frameworks for PCI are stable and mature. They're high quality and it's pretty easy to use them. Uh, it gets more complicated on the device side because we do not really have a framework when Linux is the device, the PCI device. Uh, what we are doing, we are trying to reuse the code between the two drivers, of course, uh, especially in the, in the part when we are, when we, where we are implementing the protocol. Uh, and also we have a part of the code that is in the bootloader because when we are bo booting by PCI, uh, we need that too. Uh, the PCI interface allows you to map a part of a device memory to the host memory. We are using that for the, for the shared memory uh, of, the, of the air clusters. We also use uh, the mapping for some peripheral um, registers. And the big DDR uh, is accessible from the host uh, by, a DM, by DMA transfers. Uh, and we, we do have to deal with the cache effects uh, on both sides. Uh, and a part of our protocol of communication is the notification who is using which, uh, which area of memory to be sure that we are flashing the caches uh, as we should. Uh, Currently, our main method to boot uh, the chip uh, is by the PCI. In this case, uh, we uh, load a small code uh, to the shared memory. We start the processor. It runs. In, it initializes all of the peripherals that are necessary uh, for, uh, uh, for further work. And then it sends a notification by PCI to the host that, uh, and the host then loads the final image to the shared memory and to the DDR. And then it starts the processor again. And for example, Linux starts uh, on the chip. And that doesn't, doesn't end here because we also do have to boot uh, other clusters, the compute clusters. The images for that are put also to the DDR and that's IO cluster that's doing uh, the work to send, uh, send the images. Up to this point, I've told you about the subsystems that we have stable uh, and that they are uh, working well. And you will be able to see them working uh, today in something like one hour, I think, at the demo session. We are currently working on some, uh, on some other device drivers. Uh, the network on chip driver, it's a very important one. As the network on chip uh, is it's high bandwidth, but also the main method to communicate between the processors. It is very important and it is also used everywhere. So we are using it in the kernel space uh, to do the boot, uh, to do certain drivers, and we also, 
need to allow the user space to do the IPC to be able to communicate uh, between the parts of the application. Uh, currently, uh, there is no API in Linux that supports a type of a network and chip interface. If you are maybe working on something like that, we'll be very happy to hear from you because we'll have to propose some API for this. So we'll be very happy to hear from uh, someone with similar experience to have some uh, interface that works well for everyone. Just a question. So are the computing clusters actually coherent to each other? Or all the communication goes through the network and chip? All the communication goes through the network and chip. And the uh, memory is sort of segmented, there's allocated per cluster, but you have a huge shared DR, right? Are, there's private memory uh, in it for each cluster. Yeah. Is it partially allocated per cluster? Because that's why I ask about concurrency. Uh, it's completely configurable in software. So effectively, a cluster will just use a part of the DDR on its own, and other cluster will have another part. It can. Okay. It can, but it has to pass through the NOC uh, to do that. I've told you that the NOC is very important. It's also important because, because some drivers are using it. We do have eight, up to eight alternate interfaces. Uh, they, are standard, they are Mac, as any other alternate device. They have a file. And they are also using the network and chip to push the data uh, through, uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the rest of the chip. Uh, what we are working on is a distributed, some, some kind of a distributed network stack where you can run um, certain protocols, a certain applications, use uh, their own connections in, in different areas of the chip. So we need to redirect the right packets in the right place uh, for, the, for, the, for the software to deal with it. Now, Let's move to debugging. We have a number of debugging methods. Oh. At the high level, uh, we do have hardware traces. Uh, here you have an example of a Linux boot with quite many trace points uh, inside. I was just looking if the scheduling is working, uh, working correctly in this if, and if it's scheduling what I, what I wanted to, it to do. Uh, there was a presentation yesterday about tracing of the MPPA. You can still download the PDF of the presentations if you are more interested in that. Uh, so we also have the um, support for, um, for the printk. We cannot live without printk. Uh, on, uh, on your right, on this side, uh, you have the run, uh, there's a print K uh, by, uh, by JTAG. And on the other side, you have the same moment in the GDB. We, have, uh, we can run the code in JDB from the first instruction. So here, we, as you can see from the trace, we are, we are in the middle of the kernel. And then you have another run that's pretty similar. Uh, but that, that is done in our instruction set simulator. Uh, you do have a trace that goes out of the simulator that has values of all, all the registers when there are operations of them and the cycles uh, when they happen. So it's pretty helpful uh, to, do, to do the low level debugging uh, if we have to. So when we are debugging, normally we are using all of the, uh, of the methods we are mixing them uh, all together. So there are certain things that were difficult when, when doing this port. First thing was that uh, Linux documentation is great, but it's less great when you are porting for a new architecture. There are big blocks of the code that do not really have any documentation. There are some great examples. Uh, for example, the atomic uh, operations, they do really have a very nice documentation describing everything. That was pretty nice. 
But in many places, we just had to look into other ports to understand what a specific function is doing and implement and why it's doing that and implement that in a such a way that we, it will work uh, well for us. As we are a startup, we are doing our process all. We are also reaching limits on, of our own software. So when I'm debugging a bug in Linux, it does not really always mean that the bug is in the Linux port itself. It may be somewhere in the other place. Uh, from the beginning, we are trying to be mainline compatible to get included uh, when it will be possible. Uh, that means that from time to time, uh, we are not doing a dirty hacks, we are doing proper solutions. Uh, one of the examples is that uh, we've seen one of the architectures um, having some comments about them not of one of the new architectures. Uh, having comments of them not using device three when they wanted to merge, and we we started using device trees. It was just at the beginning, so that was pretty easy to do. Uh, it's also pretty hard to split some parts of the port uh, of the work on porting on, of Linux between multiple people because there are too many dependencies of the things you you need to do. And it also, the Linux port, uh, it takes time to do. And we needed some operating system to run on our processor uh, to, to test it. So that's why we, we ported RTMS uh, first. But it was not all difficult. Uh, I find it quite surprising that the debugging, in fact, wasn't the hardest part. Uh, this, in a big part, that's because of the tools we have, of different uh, levels of tools we have. So I can choose the right tool at different level of the problem. Uh, another very nice thing was the, the existence of generic headers. So we are using them everywhere uh, when they are available. Uh, I think that they are very good help uh, for people uh, doing the, the new ports, and I really, I really like uh, like that. Also, there are some architectures that have been merged recently, and the code is less complicated uh, than the code of some other architectures, some more ancient architectures. So that was a pretty nice uh, source of examples how to do things. So, uh, in the f what we are currently working on is to finish the support of the drivers for the Linux port. They are running on their, in their RTMS version, at a minimum. So we are porting drivers between the, between the operating systems, in fact. Uh, we need to finish the work of, on the MMU optimization. Uh, and do some optimization uh, on some function that we can implement nicely uh, with our special instructions of our call. We currently, we are using uh, generic headers, and we can gain uh, on, uh, on uh, performance by doing that. Uh, we'd la also like to do a public release uh, soon, and uh, we'll, uh, we, we are really seriously aiming at uh, mainlining, mainlining the, the architecture. So if you do have any questions, you can ask them now. You can send me an email if you are interested. Uh, and before we, uh, we go f to the other sections, I'd like, you, uh, to, I'd like to invite you for, uh, for the demo session during the, uh, the demo. Uh, at the demo stands, uh, you will be able to see it, uh, see it running um, on a real, on a real hardware, uh, and I can, uh, I can answer some questions now. So, huh? When can I buy one, and what is the 
interesting software will I be able to run with it? Uh, so the question was uh, when you can buy one and what software you can run on it. So if you want to buy one, I think our sales department will be extremely happy <laughs> if you say, they, they have the, the forms ready, you can buy, uh, that, that's pretty serious, you can buy the, that board now. Uh, but if you want to buy uh, 10,000, uh, 10, uh, 10, uh, no problem, uh, I think. It will be no problem for them. So too. <laughs> and uh, what kind of software uh, you can run uh, on it? Uh, the processors are generic purpose. They can have all the capabilities. So in fact, what you can ru run nearly everything. Uh, what you will be able to see today running really on the chip are so demo applications, mostly the visual ones, so uh, video processing applications. That's something we can, uh, we can show you uh, running currently, but we also do have uh, other examples. Uh, we, uh, mm, for example, we are running some, uh, some networking applications because we have uh, many, uh, uh, many uh, network interfaces. There. So in fact, w whatever you imagine. And it, it, it can be programmed in C, so there's no problem really. Yeah? So was video processing uh, like the, the core application you were thinking of making the CPU? I mean, I know it's general purpose, but there must have been some particular uh, targets you are having. Application domains you want to use it for, or is like Bitcoin mining or whatever else? <laughs> so the question was: uh, Is the video processing uh, the main target, or maybe we we are running other uh, other things too? So the video applications have some nice properties. They need a lot of processing power, so they can use the processor pretty well. And we have some experts in the domain who are really porting the, the algorithms uh, to this. Uh, we are also running some crypto cryptographic uh, operations. So if you are interested in Bitcoin, I know the, the numbers for the, um, for the SHA algorithms myself pretty well. Um, and the other things, yeah, you can run, uh, you can run them too. To the CUDA? Yeah. So the question was how it uh, compares to the CUDA. Mm. When you have this processor, uh, the applications we are running on, on it today, uh, they are running uh, between five, at between 5 at an, and 10 watts on the whole processor. Uh, I think, yeah, that you can compare it with GPU that takes a, a little more than that. And the processing power, oh, you can send me a question. I will try, I will check, uh, I will check the, um, uh, the gigaflops per second number for you uh, if you want. Because I don't remember it at the moment. 200? 200? Okay, maybe. 200, uh, my colleague says 230 uh, gigaflops. And uh, what uh, frequency does it run? Uh, the question was what frequency it runs. Uh, this version runs at 400 megahertz. You have a somewhat unique architecture among Linux implementations. Are there any areas of Linux kernel that are being stretched by your architecture that might need some improvements or changes to work better on your boards and your processors? Uh, so the question was that our architecture uh, has, is pretty unique. So do we have uh, some problems with some, um, some kernel subsystems? Uh, the answer is that at the core level, uh, it's not really that complicated. And the core level itself, and in the, at the um, uh, processor group itself, 
there are really not many problems. Uh, it's, it's getting a little more complicated when we are in the device drivers. Uh, when uh, we, for example, the API for the network on chip interface that for, for us is absolutely critical to have it a very high performance because that's what's driving the chip. So we do not, we cannot compromise on that. So I've, we, are, we are pretty aware that we'll have to propose an API for that because there's nothing. Is the network stack adequate then or do you bypass the standard network stack? The question was if the network stack is adequate. Uh, we think that yes. Um, if we, uh, we are running multiple experiments uh, currently, and if we, if we find something that needs tweaking, we'll be uh, definitely uh, posting some, uh, some patches on that. Uh, as you said, uh, this CPU is, uh, is placed on an extension board, yes, and uh, it works something like a processor in a bigger system, yeah? Uh, any runner yet. Uh, so is it possible uh, to build a standalone uh, device with the CPU that puts itself to Linux? So the question was uh, if it's possible to have a, uh, to build a board with this chip that boots uh, on standalone. And the answer is yes. Uh, we are booting currently by PCI because that's how we designed our first testing board. Uh, there, there are other boards coming uh, soon uh, that uh, will be booting differently. We, in general, we can boot from Flash also. Without any external, without, without any external, uh, external things uh, on the board, this processor can run uh, completely standalone. How do perform a load balancing on such a large amount of uh, processing cores? Uh, the question is how to uh, do the load balancing on... So the question was um, how we are scaling uh, it all because there is a paper showing that the scalability of Linux um, has its limits at a certain level. So the answer is that currently what we are running uh, is the Linux on the peripheral side, on the four cores, four cores for Linux, no problem. Uh, and. Uh, in the compute, uh, compute matrix, we are running custom runtime that's running one thread all the time. Uh, so we do not have the, the, the problem of, uh, of the, we are not running a scheduler on it. We have enough cores to have each, uh, to, to give uh, each uh, thread its own processor. But then you, actually, but then you need uh, some space or some non-standard uh, programming model. It's not like I can uh, sit and write uh, any program at the, to, to run. So the question was, uh, in this case, you have to uh, do a little, the programming a little bit differently. Uh, when you are, want to program a multi-core application that works effectively, you may start from, from your sequential application but you will have to find the parallelism in this application. You, there are some that do exist, some tools that do it automatically, but normally most people do it pre, in a pretty manual way. There are tools that, allow, that help you in that, but currently I do not know of any tool that will be totally, absolutely automatic. So you have to, in fact, you have to Think how your application works uh, 
to make it work well on multi-core. It's also true for uh, for X86 with uh, 16 cores, for yes, example. Yes, but in X86 you have uh, uh, two, four, eight cores. Here you require me to think of uh, 256 cores. Uh, so the, the, the comment was that in this case there are a little more than 16 in the, um, uh, um, the, on the, on the Intel side. So I would say that simply when I'm running an application for MPPA, everything that can be run that I think is a little independent from the other things, I put a thread. Simply. Uh, and, and yes, and you do have a data flow programming model that allows you to express express a graph of the things uh, of the operations, and then uh, it, it the tool does uh, does the does the parallelism for you. So what I don't quite get is, um, okay, say I have 256 cores. If I would write in POSIX or however in Linux, 256 processes, would I need to do anything extra so this thing runs on this course? Or is it the standard Linux programming model? Uh, so the question was, <coughs> if we write 256 processes um, a program, do we have to do uh, changes in application? Uh, so, currently, uh, you will have to change the IPC communication a little bit. Say they are independent. I make a hello ah, world, okay. 156 processes. So, uh, the, qu the question was, if we have a hello world, 256 hello words. That's 256 hello words, no, hello words, no changes. Okay. You will have to just have to write the program for the air cluster to boot all that. Okay. But that will be a loop. <laughs> so, um, just to clarify the model, um, you've got your Linux up and running, okay, on the platform. You do cat proxy PU info. Yeah. <laughs> How many processors do you see? One? Four. Can, can four. provide you the... Uh, it, de it depends. Uh, one or four, depending if you're running single core or SMP. Well, that's exactly what I'm trying yeah. to get to, right? <laughs> you have 256 hardware thread executions, I mean, yeah. hardware execution threads in the system. But it's not under uh, the, 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 the question. The question is if, we, uh, if there are 256 uh, hardware execution uh, units in, for, the, for the kernel. And how do you map it into the normal Linux, uh, into yeah. normal, normal Linux system? That's so yeah. the yeah. Linux is running on the peripherals, okay. and the rest, the scheduling for all the rest, uh, is in the libraries uh, that are uh, that dealing with the network and chip. Yeah, exactly. So, this, this yeah. so Linux this, this does, doesn't see them as 256 yeah. processes. Uh, for the question is if the Linux does see uh, does see all the other processors. Currently, it does not. We may be thinking about running Linux also on the on the compute nodes. Okay. Yeah. So if I do it PS, I, w I won't see them, basically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, how do you load balance the network traffic on the? So uh, the question was how do we load balance the network traffic? Uh, uh, so, that depends on the programming model you use uh, for your application. Uh, in some models, it's done automatically. It runs some equations to calculate uh, the balancing, and then you are sure it's right. You can calculate uh, the traffic yourself to be sure you, are, you have the right levels in every place. Uh, or you can use the default policy that simply you, you send and normally it works quite well because um, because the network chip is is pretty fast. So normally you would you won't uh, want to find uh, problems. And every every cluster com can communicate with every other cluster also. Do we have any other questions? Have you 
third is that? Uh, the question was, does it share something with ST, uh, ST200? It was a very similar, also known as an LX. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We are based in, uh, in Grenoble area. <laughs> <laughs> I think that answers your question. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> any other questions? Okay, I do not see any any, so thank you and I see you at the demo session. <laughs>